Hey, it's your buddy, Peace and Harmony with you here today. Much love going out to all the beautiful Empowered Harmonizers, and we are here wishing you a very happy, healthy, and joyous and prosperous new year moving forward. We really want to get a jump on this new year and look it forward, pay it forward. Make sure that things are really going in the up and up or the direction, the mode, the modality, whatever it is that you want to experience and create in your life moving forward. So happy new year from the Peace and Harmony studio. And we are going to be zooming in and focusing in on sort of a great viewer topic that we just got in. And that is really how do you hand it? You know, how do you handle, how do you manage um, maybe a difficult teenager? Um, if it's a male, if it's a female, you know, realize that the teenage years can be very disruptive, unsettling, and what it, you know, what you might really uh, want to reframe and understand, um, especially if you're in a relationship with another, you know, you're co-parenting, and maybe this person has not been the leader, has not been forthright, has not been all there, uh, has not been present for you. They might even have a pathological sense of self-importance, like a covert narcissist, where they sort of chasse themselves, sort of unwind themselves from responsibility. They just sort of check out. Um, not my job. Just when you go up to someone in a store and they're like, that's not my department, even though they're standing right there in the department. So it's a way to understand very many dynamics uh, that are going on when you have a either your co-parenting with a narcissist, a covert narcissist, or a psychopath who is sort of not there forthright in the ways that are needed as a role model. Um, and, you know, how do you handle this then with the after effects, the aftershock, the influence, not leadership, but influence with a teenager, <clears throat> their identity um, is really what you're seeing here when things become what you might consider conduct disorder, bad behavior. You know, the teenagers uh, with like an operational defiant disorder, which means they're very rebellious. Uh, they re rebuke and push away what is known as authority, whether it's a parent, an adult, or a police figure. You know, um, authority is sort of what they want to buck against. They have a resistance to, which means they're not drawn to, they're not collaborating with, they don't have the presence to be able to interface with that because so knowing that they're lacking that ability, they will then resort to many difficult behaviors, difficult relationship styles, difficult attachment or really attachment difficulty, what you might consider a difficulty bonding, connecting, having a relationship with this teenager. So you've got a lot of dynamics going in. It's a great way to kick off the year, I feel, because it really draws into focus the many layers and levels of influence and uh, sort of uh, the power play that will go on not only with this type of individual as a you know, individual, but also as a marriage partner, as a spouse, as an ex, and then also uh, co-parenting styles um, and, and managing this, as well as um, good leadership guidance and helping them manage their emotions as a child, let alone a teenager that might be absent um, from the picture because of a covert narcissist has a very... Uh, textbook is just a pattern with them that they just are absent. Um, they are not present for specific tasks that might you know, require leadership, that might require authority. Uh, they will not, instead of it sort of them contributing, there'll be a uh, withholding, if you will, on a covert narcissist. So how do you understand and how do you manage that? You know, um, understanding the covert narcissist that they're very withdrawn, and then they will sort of uh, make it uh, known that, you know, they don't feel that they want to upset their rhythm, their perhaps um, substance abuse. Um, they want to live in that covert narcissist, quiet, isolated, just sort of numbed out, checked out 
um, removed or aloof state. So the covert narcissist is known for just sort of not being present, not sort of coming to task, not coming toe to toe where they need to. They just sort of uh, politely excuse themselves. They haven't done anyone any harm or foul to specifically point to, but there is an absence of role model. There is an absence of authority. There is an absence of guidance, especially when we talk about co-parenting, um, especially with, say, a male child, which is going to be different from a teenager, and realize that, you know, the growth pains of the teenage years are going to be the tough, the toughest and the most difficult in any book, really in any teenager's life, let alone if they're missing a role model. They're especially a male, sort of uh, missing a male role model. So I talk about on the channel how important it is for you to have a mentor, a role model. In the book that I'm working on, I think it's very important for you to really understand and become clear, consciously clear of who, you know, you look up to. Who do you truly admire? Are they a political figure, a religious figure, an artist, a musician, a businessman? Um, you know, take some time to really get to know this about yourself. It might be a saint, it might be a priest, but you really might know who you look up to for some reason. Um, you know, you need to have um, a uh, someone to look up to and then have a healthy template or role model for behavior. So if you're co-parenting with a covert narcissist, they're going to sort of shriek out. They're going to sort of, you know, um, just sort of very quietly and subtly sort of just not be where they are challenged um, in areas where they are insecure, but they don't want to sort of admit, I don't know what to do here. I don't know. Um, they, you know, a, a covert narcissist uh, famously does not like to uh, feel that they have any sort of weak spot, uh, that they don't know something, that they can't communicate certain feelings. Uh, that's their exterior shell. Uh, that they want you to always sort of play to, talk to, you know, talk to the hand or, you know, talk to my persona that has been created and fabricated rather than the real. Um, they want you to sort of bypass, skip over, be distracted from the real. And that's when all the defense mechanisms come up to distract you, especially if there's substance abuse, um, alcoholism. Um, also was sort of drawn into this question. I mean, we could talk about this for uh, many long, long periods of time, but just to sort of um, come up with the ones that I'm um, trying to help our viewers understand where I feel, you know, when alcoholism and many things can be comorbid, which means uh, there's a personality trait and then there's other abuse traits, meaning substance abuse, uh, food abuse, uh, whatever abuse that is sort of using it in the wrong way, you know, using things um, in, 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 in an accurate way, not as it's meant to be, but humans are really a unique uh, individuals that really can sublimate these normal areas. So they sort of mix up their own system and um, things can go awry. We can get acting out. So if the covert narcissist um, is a co-parent and largely distant, absent from the picture, not really a positive influence, then especially to the perception of a teenager who really, if they feel, um, I would say now just speaking to this, the dynamic of a teenage son to their father, realize that teenage sons need their sense of masculinity, i.e. strength, i.e. authority, i.e. power, i.e. manhood, I am, you know, in other words, to be, which is different than what a, a female is to be. So like a male is to be a provider, you know, these typical, uh, you know, the stronger one, the one who's got the toolkit, who can fix the roof, uh, who can look and fix the toilet, but also who can be a role model to the teenager and, you know, take them out to throw balls. Um, whatever it is, teach them to fish, something productive that they do together and create a bond, a uh, sort of connection where the, the parent is the leader and then showing them the way. And then, you know, the son goes, oh, I get it. It all, many areas and stages of life, especially in the first, I would say, 
25 to 26 years, but more so, you know, zero through seven, and then definitely through the teenage years is very intense. So teenagers, if they are then sort of um, mimicking uh, this absence of a covert narcissist um, parent, so realize if there's a parent dynamic, um, I feel that is where that person is sort of not showing up. They're just sort of asleep on the job, if you will. They're just sort of not coming through and they don't want to come through. They feel that they're going to draw a boundary where, you know, that's not my job, even though it is just like if you go to a doctor and then they're giving you a, an exam and a major issue with you is your neck. And then they don't write that in the notes and they're going, well, I don't, you know, that's not my responsibility. I'm not a neck doctor. I just deal with um, nerve issues. And that's, you know, implicated uh, directly, but they're just, no, I just deal with, you know, that, you know, so in other words, there's different le um, areas of responsibility that a covert narcissist will either be relatable for, or they will shriek away from, they will disappear. They will not be present. Um, especially if it doesn't make them look good, if they're not getting an ego stroke or a validation, especially, uh, you know, and akin to this, I think is if you have substance abuse and alcoholism, and then the young teenager sees this basically as a weakness, a deficit, even though the teenager doesn't go, wow, well, this substance that you're indulging in, it really makes you not able to see, hear, or understand. And when you talk, it sounds like you've got gauze in your mouth. I mean, so a child, doesn't do that. Um, they don't process that and they don't say to themselves, oh, but I need a father who's strong, present, who can listen, uh, be rational, reasonable, help me with results, A, B, C, one, two, three. So the child oftentimes isn't able to verbalize that. Um, there is a fear, especially if there's that um, weakness in the role model. In other words, how am I going to make it across the river? How am I going to wade through this puddle? How am I going to handle this situation at school or my own identity, which is very, um, I don't want to say fragile, but it's in the growth mode, especially in the teenage years and especially all the hormones and how do I relate to girls and boys and where do I belong? I mean, there is so many, so rich area um, of this area, but you know, so you have to understand so many working parts, especially the teenager who is looking for who to belong with, who to lock arms with, you know, who is my posse? Who do I relate to? And then if you're then, if you don't have that strong connection because of a covert narcissist or alcoholism, which takes them effectively out of the game, they're not present. They're not all there. Their senses are not sharp, clear, and there's a percussive change, if you will. I really do feel um, then if there's this percussive change, which means, you know, everything from, you know, they, they're not able to uh, be rational oftentimes in their emotions. The alcohol is doing the talking. Um, and then you get, you know, sort of different uh, moodiness with alcoholism. And you don't know if you're going to get um, the person who's, you know, drunk and passed out, the uh, person who's, um, you know, fallen asleep at the wheel, who's, uh, you know, asleep on the floor, or they are in the basement, the attic, um, in the crawl space, you know, wherever it is that, you know, this will happen. So, Boys um, and girls, as teenagers, but we're especially if you're dealing with a son, you know, they need sort of a champion. They need a, a strong role model that is able to be a sense of authority and unwavering. And especially challenging is you kind of have the alpha male, you know, so if you've got uh, a lack of responsibility and accountability, this will freak out a teenager. Um, whether it's a boy, uh, or a teenage girl, if their uh, parental figure is not all there, no eye contact, no warmth, no communication, uh, no percussiveness or rhythm of such. So like alcoholism can also take out that rhythm. So rather than, you know, this being the, uh, a certain flow in a percussive rhythm of being able to rely, trust, certainty, safety, um, you know, the absence of fear, um, you know, and so when, when the parent <clears throat> is sort of checked out, this creates an alarm for children. They get alarmed right away. 
um, you know, we are in a situation and we can't handle all this. So in other words, a teenager, they can't pay the bills. They can't uh, drive the car. They can't fix the hot water heater. Um, and they're very acutely aware of this. Um, but yet that is their uh, need is to be able to do these things. So inside they will feel very inadequate, like they're falling short. And so they'll then grip and then hold on to ways to get some semblance of control and structure to offset that absence, that void, which becomes like a power vacuum. So with the absence of this, so in other words, there's an energetic template <clears throat> that a son needs to model and with the parent. And then if the parent is absent or not present, um, you know, um, under an influence of a substance or, path, you know, pathological sense of self-importance, which means the parent is just too busy for them. Um, I'm too important to deal with you, the child. Um, you should be doing this right now. Like, you don't need a role model. You need to go and uh, uh, shovel the driveway. You need to go and fix this. You need to, you know, so in other words, the child doesn't get that playfulness. They don't get that carefree. They don't get that experience of discovery and then self-reliance, autonomy, industriousness. They're going on the other side. They're, they're going on the shame, embarrassment, humiliation, um, feeling in, inadequate, becoming less industrious. So acting out, they're acting out what they're feeling inside and then what was done to them. And then they're made out to be the bad guy, but oftentimes there is a similar insulationary behavior. I would say, so it would be, I would say not uncommon to see this sort of duplicated in its own way in the teenager. So if the parent is covert absence, um, alcoholic, um, and they don't have that healthy rhythm, that per what I would call a percussiveness. Um, if you read, uh, Judith White's book, um, she will talk about that. And so, you know, you'll oftentimes see the children who aren't able to communicate, their words will be slurred, just like an alcoholic. They'll act sort of out of it, just like an alcoholic. They'll act aloof, just like the alcoholic or the covert. So, but it's, it, they're not learning to experience their own in the, I am in the positive. So, they're not getting that identity that I am that is has an image of them in a positive, healthy manner that's typified where a relationship is very absent. In other words, there's an influence, there's an absence of power. There's an absence of healthy and respect of authority. And that then it is then shared and communicated so that the child then can learn and grow and speak clearly and have eye contact and know what respect is and have healthy boundaries. But if you're aloof, it's just sort of the, the boundaries and the I am of the child is not validated. So then the child goes, oh my God, well, it's a free for all. I'm going to do whatever. <clears throat> and you might see them breaking rules, conduct disorder, you know, truancy, um, uh, theft, vandalism, uh, doing strange things that, you know, you wouldn't expect you know, a child to do that a parent would tell them, no, don't do that. You know, they might come to school and they might just bring in all of a sudden a shoe box and they might just pick up some animals um, that they just saw. And no parent was there to say, well, don't pick up all those baby bunnies because, you know, or this bird. And then they're just, you know, so little, um, very strange behaviors that you might consider with that, that the child is then not respecting authority. When in fact, the the child really does want authority. They do want to learn. They do want to buddy up. They do need guidance. They do need to be shown how. They do need to be taught to identify what their feelings are and to learn how to manage, identify, and soothe these internally. But if, if they don't have that, then they resort to all sorts of other uh, uh, sundry um, things that they will turn to in lieu of, in, in a deficit of that. So they will, um, they can turn to, um, drug addiction. Um, they can turn to gambling addiction. They can turn to truancy, a different lifestyle. Uh, you know, all these things you consider a rebe a rebel, a bad guy, a bad girl, you know, when it's, they're really just looking for that 
uh, really innate need to be acknowledged and validated. So to be seen as somewhat of an authority or an I am in who you are. So for those people who are lacking this, they will resort to other ways to get, you know, um, instant authority and acknowledgement. So threatening behavior, uh, breaking things, slamming doors, hurting property. You know, I'll show you who has the power around here. And it's very, very reckless. So, you know, these um, traits can really have a lot of overlap. So, you know, it's difficult enough to um, have teenage children, but it's also very difficult when you're dealing with an absent parent or a parent who is on substance abuse, meaning that they're not all there. They're, you know, drinking uh, liquor, they're doing whatever drugs, they're um, all the uh, pill addiction, the opioids, whatever it is uh, that is causing this rift will remain a rift. Um, and, and so oftentimes that, that individual who is the covert narcissist, they're not going to come down from their ivory tower. They're not going to come down from their you know, place um, on, on the top, uh, on the penthouse. They're, you know, they feel that they're, it's not their responsibility. <clears throat> so even though that might be not be right, fair, what was agreed to, uh, the norms of society or what have you, um, unfortunately, you have to identify and just say, it is what it is. And not feeling scared, hurt, or intimidated by this because oftentimes that can cause a lot of additional anxiety and feeling that you can't manage um, the the teenager because they have they don't have this shape, you know they're looking to be shaped and molded and have a direction. So you have to then, um, you know, my feeling with with children is you bring out um, their their qualities and what they're looking for and realize that a a teenager needs to have a positive sense of self regard. If they're missing that, then the other is going to proliferate. And continue and just sort of run a blaze and be very destructive, meaning it just burns all to ashes. You don't have, you know, it's it's got a lot of energy, but it can be very difficult to tame and sort of channel that their energy, which can be acting out, meaning they are just doing because they're not able to articulate or communicate. They're acting out of fear in an insulary way, which means they're trying to insulate, protect their own hurt self, which they don't want to come across as that, especially a boy. They're going to want to blame uh, and also, I would say, take out a lot of aggression and hostility because of this absence onto the very people whom they feel should be accountable. So they, you know, feel that maybe they have been failed in some way. So, but they don't articulate this. They're not able to oftentimes to say, oh yeah, I'm, hey, by the way, you know, I'm breaking this um, because I don't have a, a good role model where I'm, I have uh, been acknowledged and validated and been listened to as the a game that I am or I need to be. So you need to sort of realize that this struggling teenager has an A game. They have a best self. They have a best I am. It's a work in progress. You know, you might have one of those big road horses up. You can't go there right now because it's still under construction. In fact, it might be sort of still under demolition right now. It might be in the breakdown phase of breaking down you know, the issue or the structure that was, you know, uh, a teenager, I would say with a covert narcissist, they will continually run into a wall. They will, they will feel a lot of blocks. They will not get the communication. And I would say the percussiveness of positive self-esteem. So meaning a positive sense of self put into action. So they will find themselves bottoming out, breaking routine, breaking schedules, uh, this doesn't work for me. Uh, the normal, what everybody else is, I am not. So they're defining themselves by the absence, the abyss, the void as if. <clears throat> and then this creates a really large uh, power, uh, power vacuum <clears throat> going in the wrong direction, <clears throat> which means they're going to test the system until someone will show them what the boundaries are. So until they buck up then with law, um, you know, they will, you know, 
find that there are certain rules that they must acknowledge and validate. And the identity, though, if they don't have a sense of being able to fit in with their own sense of authority, children need to have a sense of um, authority, which is safety to them, which is guidance, and which is structure, in which then not only becomes influence, but it becomes their future, their I am, and the ability to look forward. So if you don't have that, and then the teenage child is running on fight or flight as a chronic ongoing basis, which means they're going to be on attack mode. They're going to be on destruction mode. They're on unhappy mode. They are not being acknowledged and validated. And they can't because of this sort of gulf, if you will, that they're going to put up. And so how do you make that connection? Realize that there's going to be a lot of pushback. This is, you know, this has been some time in the making and you're dealing with some very strong and powerful really sort of emotions, but you're really dealing when, you know, we talk about the, the three brains, sort of that subconscious primal need um, to uh, for belonging and to be able to provide and to have, especially if there's an absence um, of that male-male partnership, <clears throat> there will be a testing of the male figure. You know, can you handle this? Are, and so if that teenage boy um, sees a weakness Oh boy, they will go after it like a, a starving person after a, a fresh meat. I mean, they will be all over it f to save their life. It'll, it's like a, um, someone who has been crawling through the desert um, and they have not had water for three days, four days, seven days, and then all of a sudden they see the water. I mean, they are that needy. They, they're they on that sort of survival, if you will. But they are wearing jeans and a t-shirt. that You don't see them uh, crawling through the desert, but internally, their limbic brain, that's what they feel like. They feel like they cannot make it. They don't have that water of life. They don't have that flow. They don't have the leadership. They don't have that life-sustaining energy. They don't have the rules, the values to um, look up to and connect with. There hasn't been a connection there. And so you have to realize and give credit where credit is due that the child is trying to speak out in the ways that are natural and just built in. It doesn't make them a bad person. Um, you know, this objection, this acting out is just a request for more information. <laughs> so in, in other words, all this acting out is like, I'm really, I just need more information. So you have to understand the role of reframing, which means your ability, I would say, especially as the parent in this, instead of it seeing, oh, this is um, identified, this is problematic, uh, this can really going out of control, uh, this is a bad kid maybe, maybe this will, you know, so all this sort of your fear, you have to get intimate with how you're really um, interpreting this. And use the role uh, of the cognitive role of reframing, which means your ability to review and then reanalyze from a positive and empowered standpoint, seeing things clearly uh, for what it really is, not as a, I'm lost, I don't know what to do, coming from a place of weakness, but from I'm coming from a place of observation, knowledge, wisdom, and strength, and I'm actually facing it. Um, so facing this, which oftentimes the covert narcissist does not do, the alcoholic does not do, they just vanish into the bottle. Uh, they go back into the flask. They go back into the pill bottle. They are like a, uh, you know, a jack in the box that just goes back in the box rather than being present and being there. They're not attentive. So it's, all, you know, a cry for attention, all these things, but you have to understand especially the pattern <clears throat> that is created. And a lot of people may not understand this. They're just, you know, you know, or especially your intimacy and with this and what to do. So realize to reframe it saying, you know, here is a leader in the making. Here is a provider who is requesting more information. They are in need of, but it's, they will create a wall, a buffer, a shell, which is their boundary. They just want to be isolated. And it's really because of the pain. So oftentimes you have to then look at behaviors 
and allow actions to speak louder than words. So realizing that this, um, you know, when children, um, you're co-parenting with this child, that you need to be able to give them what they are truly needing without addressing it in a condescending, hurtful, or triggering way. So the authority of it, you know, so, um, you know, in, in an objective way. So having respect, even though you might have this bias of being very close to your son, reframing it, seeing that this child actually needs, you know, to be armed with some tools. They need to manage what their role model is. They need to manage what their template is. They need to manage what they're going for. The difference between men and boys is the price of their toys. So realize, you know, you're tasked with helping this child to become empowered so they can be become autonomous and have a healthy sense of self so they can support themselves, have an interest, have their own roof over their own head, have their own bank account, their own signature, their own credit score. So that's like where we want to go um, looking forward. We're going to talk a lot today um, about that, sort of how important it is to break free from that ruminating, which obviously a child who's acting out, they're still playing the records of the past. They're getting that big 33 inch and they're going, yeah, you know, they're still versus they're still you know playing from the past because they they're not able to be liberated to have the that positive solid sort of template and vision for themselves their I am moving forward so you have to realize that there's a kaleidoscope of vision that we need to sort of be able to pull out from them even when they're in this very caustic very unsettling time and we're going to discuss about more how to do that I mean a half an hour does not cover it. Um, but realizing the true needs through reframing, meaning this child um, needs, and according to your discretion and choice, you know, what would what is not humiliating, but what is strengthening to this child, you know, giving them their own this. In other words, you know, you manage this. So giving them a way to have some authority over self. So and some choices, um, especially when it comes to, uh, I would say, consequences and structure, creating a, a structure for this, meaning like a zone and reflecting back to them in a positive sense of self, um, even if they're charged up, because this is a very, very valid, real, scary place for this teenager, but they're not, you know, it is really a big no, no. For a teenage boy to go, I'm scared. I don't know what to do here. Oh no. They're going to flip that 360 and they're going to be like, I know what to do here. Here's the fastest car. Here's the biggest hammer. Here's the biggest muscle. You know, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be the authority, but really they're crying out for authority. So you have to be able to really work on some reframing and realize and take your sort of, um, I would say maybe you're biased, like I'm a bad 